Growing up, I had a weird obsession with love. The first time I fell in love, I was four. I still remember his name. His name was Alexandre, and he was a classmate of mine in kindergarten. And back then, I was too shy to let him know that I was in love with him. As time went by, things changed. I was still shy, but a bit more impulsive. At 13, I had this huge crush on this boy that used to play football, and I used to watch him every day before we went to class. So I had decided on his birthday to get him a gift. It was a mouse for his laptop that was in the shape of a football. Little did I know that one week later, the whole class was going to make fun of me. And that's when I had experienced my first real heartbreak. But like all kids at school, I moved on pretty quickly. At 15, someone had a crush on me, and he ended up getting me a flower on Valentine's Day. He was very nice, he was very handsome, but I had rejected him. I thought he smelled off. Not bad, off. Little did I know that at that young age, I had just uncovered a biological phenomenon that I would be studying years later. I find love to be such a curious feeling, a feeling so strong that it can be physically healing. When we're in love, we feel all sorts of things. We feel passionate, euphoric, and even dependent. But it, it doesn't always end up this way, does it? Sometimes we experience heartbreak, or we've all experienced longing for someone. And even when we do get on that date where we actually think, oh, I found that person, how do we know that we've made the right choice? And that's a question that kept burning someplace in my mind. And like the nerd that I am, I decided to do a master's about it. And I, I, so I did my research on partner selection, and I'm going to present to you some of the findings that I had. And I ended up there with many more questions than I did answers. Did you know that we choose our partner based on some unconscious process related to our past traumas? Or that it could be as simple as them being part of our social circle, so we end up being attracted to them as time goes by? Or it could be as simple as their sense of smell. And that gets me to a study that was made by Wedekin and Furry in the late 90s. So Wedekin and Furry are two researchers, and they got six different people. They made them wear t-shirts two nights in a row, and they wanted these t-shirts to be smelly. So they made them wear them for two nights in a row for this reason. They got the t-shirts, and then they got another group of 121 men and women, and they made them smell them. And what they had discovered was that people were attracted to the smells of other people that had different immune system genes than theirs. And so that's, that's a very natural process that we have. And we're lucky to have it because we are attracted to the people to the smells of people that make us have stronger children. And so I thought to myself, okay, I, I thought love to be something so deeply personal, yet it wasn't really this way. There was something within our body that made this process a little harder, a little less personal. So I thought to myself, okay, that's, that's not something I can actually control and work with. And that was the psychologist in me wanting to find something and to create a change out of it. And so I decided to turn from biology into psychology and look at the research over there. One very prominent researcher is called Mary Ainsworth. She came up with a theory of attachment, and so, simply put, the theory is, of attachment is about the infant-parent bond, and more specifically, primary caregiver bond with the infant. Usually, that's the mother. And so, she discovered that depending on the relationship that the child has with the mother, they end up forming a certain thought about life. And so, 
First of all, we have the secure attachment. So the secure attachment, when the child has a secure attachment with their primary caregiver, then they also feel secure to go and explore the world around them. They also feel secure enough to, with the relationships that they have and that they form. The second one is the avoidant attachment. So when a child has an avoidant attachment, they have a fear of dependence. So they tend to step back so that they can protect themselves. Third, thir the third type of attachment is the anxious attachment. So when a child has an anxious attachment, usually they end up clinging onto the mother because they are afraid of abandonment. And then we have a, f a fourth type that was discovered later on, which is the disorganized attachment. So the disorganized attachment is a confusing mix between the avoidant and the anxious. And so they tend to cling at one point, and then they tend to take their distance again. So you might be asking, well, we, we were talking about partner selection. How, why are we talking about childhood? And so as I was going through the research, I found another very interesting article that showed me that when it comes to the attachment style, well, they end up, when a child goes into adulthood, they end up having certain inflammations in their body if they have an anxious, avoidant, or disorganized attachment style. So this is, there's a certain pattern that is formed that creates inflammation within the body. And so, well, what does this really tell us, to, to put it very simply? Just imagine you're a kid. Imagine you're a five-year-old kid who goes to their mom because you made a new friend at school and you're very happy about it, and you go to your, your mom and you go like, well, mom, I made a new friend at school. And your mom is sitting there, maybe scrolling through her phone, or uh, she's worried about something else, and so she's like, honey, we'll, we'll do this another time. What would that kid feel? They would feel something within their body. They would feel something maybe in their chest, maybe in their stomach, maybe in their head. And if that gets repeated over and over and over and over and over enough times, then the child develops an insecure attachment. And so it, it makes a lot of sense because when the body is under chronic stress, it, the, our sympathetic nervous system is in fight or flight. And so it's in a state that it cannot control anymore, which creates more inflammation in the body, which sustains this attachment style that we end up carrying with us into adulthood. Now, how does this translate to the dating scene? And so I looked at the research when it came to speed dates. So the researchers got two people, one who had an anxious attachment style, one who had a secure attachment style, or vice versa with any other attachment pattern. And what they discovered was actually very interesting. It was that when someone had an anxious attachment, they tended to disclose more about themselves. They, they tended to talk more about themselves in the sense of their achievements, what they did, and that made them seem less attractive to the partner that was in front of them. Now, on the flip side, someone who had an avoidant attachment they, they ended up disclosing less about themselves. And depending on the type of person that was in front of them and the culture that they come from, it could either seem attractive or not attractive, but that really depended on the person. Second of all, we have the uh, feedback. So if someone with an anxious attachment gave positive feedback, they seemed like they were trying too hard because well, when you add someone that shares a lot about themselves and gives a lot of positive feedback to the person that's next to them, then they will seem like they are just trying too hard. And on the flip side, someone who had an avoidant attachment style, when they gave positive feedback, so for example, your hair is pretty, I like the fact that you're working in that area, that seemed more attractive because when someone doesn't talk a lot and suddenly gives you a compliment, things spike. And third of all, and I think that was one of the most, one of the most promising 
steps I stepped on when I did the research, it was about partner perception. So someone who has an anxious attachment style tended to perceive the person in front of them as more avoidant than they actually were. So they might have been a secure person, but they perceive them as someone who is just more avoidant than they actually were because maybe they're not replying fast enough to their texts. So, and on the flip side as well, someone who's an avoidant tended to see the person in front of them, even if they were secure, as more anxious than they actually were. So where does this lead us when it comes to the dating scene? What, what do we do with this information? Do we just stay away from the people that have an anxious attachment or an avoidant attachment or dis disorganized attachment? Good luck with that, because you'd be removing a big part of the population. What's, and, and especially that in, in today's world, it's, it's fairly easy to go on dates because we have the apps and we can swipe right and swipe left and just choose a person. And so the question really was, what do we do before we get on that date? And so first of all, it's important that we get to know ourselves. We get to know the type of attachment that we have. Do we have an anxious attachment, an avoidant attachment, a secure one, if we're lucky? Uh, so a good way to get to know that is to ask our friends so about the patterns that we have. So are we someone who shares a lot? Are we someone who is reserved when we receive affection from them? And our friends are good people to go to because they, we are close to them and they know the way that we are. Uh, second of all, we have a redefining label. So it's important for us to maybe look at a person who double or triple texts as someone with an anxious attachment rather than someone who's just very clingy. They're just looking for a feeling of safety. They, they want to feel safe. And so if we give them that safety, well, maybe in a month or two, they might just calm down and receive that safety from us. Because if we just label them as clingy and you know put them on the side, then we're really robbing them of getting a real chance of us getting to know who they really are on the inside. And so third of all, we have m being mindful when we go on a, on a date. So what does it mean to be mindful? To be mindful usually means to be present. Maybe you've heard of mindfulness meditation. It's to be there. It's to go with an intention, to go with an intention to actually listen and not really worry about whether or not this person is going to leave us of the first date, whether or not they're going to like us, but listen to who they are so that we can decide whether or not we actually like them. And to also listen to our body, to where we feel things physically. Do we feel pain in our stomach at some point, in our chest? Because when we listen to our bodies, we are able to recognize this pattern and so change it. Because I feel that when it comes to love, love isn't necessarily fate, because it's a pattern we can change. And thank you. <laughs>